All right. Welcome to the Global Heat Health Information Network's inaugural open forum. My name is Lad Keith, and I'm an assistant professor of planning at the University of Arizona, and I'm honored to host the open forum and our week-long management committee meeting here at the University of Arizona's Washington, D.C. Center for Outreach and Collaboration. So the University of Arizona has a robust interdisciplinary group of faculty, students, and projects, and leads the way in addressing the crises of climate and global environmental change. And the university is very enthusiastically supporting research at the intersection of climate and health, and specifically heat and health. Uh, we have several federally funded programs in this critical area, including the CDC Building Resilience Against Climate Effects Program, the Climate Assessment for the Southwest, or CLEMIS, NOAA-funded Climate Adaptation Partnership, and our newly awarded DOE Southwest Urban Corridor Integrated Field Laboratory. And so through each of these uh, funded programs and many others, we leverage our power of place in the hot desert Southwest um, for global impact on topics like heat and health. I would like to thank the university's DC Center and our Office of Research, Innovation and Impact for making, their, for making this event possible through their support. And I'm really looking forward to learning from all of the papers perspectives during this uh, open forum. With that, I'll turn it over to Joy and Julie. Thank you, Lad. So I'm Joy Shumake Emo, and I lead the Joint Office for Climate and Health between the World Health Organization and the World Meteorological Organization in Geneva, Switzerland. And together we host the Global Heat Health Information Network. And I'm joined here with Julie Tertran from NOAA, that is also the other co-sponsor of the uh, Global Heat Health Information Network. And so I'd like to start off today by introducing our management committee, many of the members who are here with us in the room. And you can see we have a representation from around the world, experts in climate and health from different, uh, different disciplines, as well as government, academic, and NGO partners. So I'd like to ask the members of the management committee that are in the room to stand up. Uh, and then we have many members who are joining us from other regions in the world uh, virtually today. So uh, thanks again to all of the committee for making this network possible. Um, and you'll be hearing from many of the members uh, later in the session. <coughs> so back in 2018, when we launched the network, it was really to raise awareness of the global risks of rising extreme heat and be able to synthesize the emerging new evidence, bring partners together, coordinate between government, NGO, and academic partners getting involved in this space and be able to learn from and leverage all of the local learnings that were coming out of these various initiatives around the world. So we are extremely excited today to see the acceleration and growth in the partners, the countries that are getting involved in taking political uh, policy action, uh, community action on extreme heat and, and health. And so today we're really excited to launch the open forum series because we've always felt that as a global community, we will definitely go farther and faster if we're doing this together. And so the Global Forum series is going to provide a regular opportunity to bring partners together. Uh, we'll be having uh, virtual seminars similar to this four times a year, starting in February, in June, in September, and November. And these are going to first and foremost be open. Anyone in the world can join the conversation that's going to happen through these dialogue and learning events. You can expect them to be interactive, they will be interdisciplinary, and they'll be a neutral forum for those interested and in working in this space from government, NGO, academia, again, to come together and talk about the real issues being faced in trying to understand the impacts of extreme heat <coughs> and what kind of action is really working uh, at the community level around the world. Um, so we welcome you to our first event. Future events are sometimes going to be attached to physical meetings and other times they'll be online. 
So we will have probably different formats than the format we have today as we grow and evolve and also learn from our global community how to convene these forums. So we'll also be asking uh, those of you here in the room and online, what would you like the forums in the future to focus on? Because we want to hear from you what matters and what can help in your activities uh, around the world. So today, we are going to spend the next two hours having a real virtual world tour. And we're going to start with a panel hearing from many of our management committee members, what are the realities that they're seeing through their programs, through their government offices, of how he is affecting the health of communities in their countries. And then we're going to turn to two panels. We're here about what's working. What are the solutions that are making change that we have good evaluations that this is actually really helping communities better prepare for and respond to extreme heat. And then we're going to open up the floor and have some questions and answers, uh, also from those that are online, and take a poll around how we should be shaping these forums in, in the future. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Julie so we can start our world tour. All right. I was asked to try this without the mic. Is that better? Keep no. going without the mic. Keep so, going without the mic. It's actually the people okay. online. Okay. No mic, correct? Yeah. All right. Then I'll speak a little more loudly. Can you guys hear me out? So my name is Julie Turton. I'm with the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, the Climate Programs, Climate Health Program. Um, but in this context, I actually lead along with CDC and the Weather Service, the National Integrated Heat Health Information System. And part of the reason that we are so pleased to be here and help start and launch this global network is that what Joy said earlier, moving further, faster together. Um, the issue of heat is not new. It's not going to go away. Um, and we can learn from each other <coughs> and make progress much more rapidly than if we just stay individually in doing this. So part of the reason that NOAA and the U.S. government has been very supportive of helping launch and sustain GEN and why we're really happy that U of A offered to host the, the management committee meeting here is it's a great opportunity for us to also listen and learn from other countries and to share knowledge both on the programmatic side, on the solution side. So um, Thank you all for joining in our first open forum. We really appreciate that, both in person and online. And as Roy said, we're gonna start first with a little bit of what's happening around the world. So this first session is really, we're calling it a little bit of a world tour of just what is the nature of the heat problems? Because it does look different in different countries and we all have different aspects of heat and different ways of managing it. But there are some commonalities and things we can learn from each other. So I'm just going to introduce the panel and then they're going to run through their, their um, stories. All right. So first we have from Canada. Oh, yeah, I can do that. Here we go. Greg Richardson from Health Canada. Jason Lee from National University of Singapore. Aviant. Uh, sorry, I know that. Um, from NRDC, also going to be speaking from his experience in India. Um, Shivayu Saha from the Centers for Disease Control in the US, and Shari Kovats from London School. Um, so, without further ado, do you want them to also not use mic? It's better without mic. Okay, better without mic. All right, so um, I'm going to just step away and let you all tell your stories. Thank you very much. Thank you. Should I jump in? Uh, for the time up there. Do you want, I can do the size if you want. That's probably better if you can do Because I want no win. So I'm Gregory Richardson. I'm the acting manager of the Extreme Heat Program in Health Canada. Speak up a little though, because Speak without the mic, little, so they can hear you in the back. Um, can people hear me in the back? A little bit? All right, I'll speak up. June 25th to July 2nd, 2021, an unprecedented heat wave impacted Western Canada and the United States. In many places, temperatures were 16 to 20 degrees Celsius above normal. Uh, numerous temperature records were broken. 
in British Columbia, it's a Canadian province with about 5 million people. Um, 619 deaths were attributed to uh, the heat event between uh, that, uh, June 25th and July 2nd, 2021. 60 death, 66 deaths um, were attributed to the heat event in Alberta. 98% uh, of deaths in British Columbia occurred indoors. That's 98% of people died indoors. And over 56, uh, over half or 56% of those people who died lived alone. Um, it's hard to go much louder. Um, most uh, deaths were in homes without suitable cooling uh, measures, uh, either passive cooling, air conditioning, fans. And most of those people who died um, could be classified as socially, um, uh, as living in socially or materially deprived neighborhoods. For British Columbia, 67% of uh, those who died, um, so two thirds, uh, were 70 years of age or above and had uh, deaths were higher among those people with a range of different uh, conditions including schizophrenia, um, with substance use disorder, <laughs> epilepsy, CP, um, COPD, depression, asthma, and anxiety disorders, diabetes. And our colleagues at the Center for, uh, British Columbia Center for Disease Control done some excellent work identifying those people who died uh, and some of their uh, comorbidities. 911 calls doubled during the peak of the heat dome. Uh, from, from Norman. Um, many people um, across the province who were waiting long times for paramedics, sometimes up to 30 minutes or more. And in some cases, a, a small number of cases, no ambulances were available. The risk of wildfires increased uh, substantially during and after the heat dome across uh, Western Canada. Lytton uh, small, is a small town in southern BC. Uh, on June 29th, uh, 2021, Lytton broke the Canadian record temperature, sorry, temperature record, reaching a high of 49.6 uh, degrees Celsius uh, peak temperature, which is extraordinary. <clears throat> on June 30th, 2021, the day after that record breaking temperature, uh, the community was destroyed by a wildfire. Um, in BC and British Columbia, 175 wildfires continue to consume 78 or almost 79,000 hectares of lands uh, during the heat dome. There were a number of different impacts to agriculture, infrastructure, uh, the environment. And just some examples. Um, uh, one example is cherry farms in southern BC. Um, and they've grown a lot of uh, fruit in, in southern BC, uh, lost 70% of their producing trees uh, due to the extreme heat. Uh, livestock were uh, significantly impacted, and this is astounding. 650,000 farm animals were estimated to have died during the heat dome. In the Salish Sea, uh, billions of invertebrates, and uh, there's some pictures here, were uh, killed by the, uh, by the high temperatures. And many of these uh, species um, were often used as indicators of the invertebrates, the marine species, as indicators of the uh, ecological impacts of climate change. And to my final slide, so the, the province of British Columbia, uh, the Canadian province most impacted by the heat dome, has taken actions uh, since the heat dome to address uh, deaths in, 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 in future conflicts, so to take action to prevent deaths in future conflicts. Um, the province has developed a province-wide heat alert and response system, which I feel is a model uh, for, um, for, for those uh, jurisdictions across Canada. And um, this new HARS, the call heat alert and response system, has new emergency level warnings and significantly improved response measures. So thanks very much. And I'll just like to thank uh, Sydney Gosselin, Gosselin, sorry, and Melissa Borman who are Health Canada who helped me all this this presentation. And to our hosts, uh, Jean and University of Arizona for hosting us. Thanks very much. Thank you.
Um, no, can you can you project? Testing one, two, three. Four. No, 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 no. no. It's no very need to online. Line. No. Okay. No, no Mike, just see it. I was Sorry. hearing that. Yeah. You can <laughs> you <laughs> just scream. The yeah. online sound is fine. Yeah. Well, okay. Yeah. Good afternoon. Uh, just short, quick run through of what's happening in Southeast Asia. Yeah, so there are quite a few things, but I will stay focused and just give you the highlights. Hopefully, I have more time to discuss with you. I'm Jason Lee. I have two roles. I co-lead the Human Potential Translation Research Programs in the School of Medicine at National University of Singapore. That is one out of 10 programs that the School of Medicine runs. I also direct the new Kids Resilience and Performance Center. So I'll tell you more about that in a while. So in this talk, I will just focus mainly on the work in Southeast Asia uh, is funded by the National Research Foundation of Singapore Core Project Kids Safe, a project that covers both workers' health and work productivity. And slightly beyond Southeast Asia, I'll highlight a couple of countries. The key thing is we, we, we brought together uh, 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 experts of various, various disciplines from engineers, physiologists, physicians, economists, so on and so forth to tackle a wicked issue in our opinions. Uh, this is not a research project to say it is beyond that. To me, it's building capacity in this region, in Southeast Asia. In short, we want to walk back to the boardroom, tell the stakeholders not just the problems, but the cause of solving the problems. And therefore, the economics uh, assessment is a key component in project itself. We believe both workers' health and productivity can be achieved in tandem. It is not a zero-sum game. So here we go, ready, we're going to go around Southeast Asia and slightly beyond. In Singapore, in collaboration with the Ministry of Manpower, we call it MOM, MOM. That's a great ministry name. I strongly encourage that. You know, no one takes care of you more than your mom. So in collaboration with Ministry of Manpower, we monitor environmental conditions of 19 outdoor work sites. Mean maximum hourly, hourly wet bulb work temperature exceeded what we define as high risk, 32 degrees Celsius on 32 WBGT and, and every work site across that threshold. It is pertinent that employers start to take ownership of this in situ where it's no good assuming that the conditions is, is, is uh, the <coughs> same as the nearer, nearest weather station, we find a huge discrepancy. So in situ monitoring is key. So the ownership of the employer uh, is to ensure <coughs> more focus health and safety. Then out of Singapore in Cambodia, in collaboration with the Institute of Technology in Cambodia, where we know is a country are uh, highly susceptible to the effects of climate change. And these effects will only greatly influence the lives of Cambodia's socially marginalized groups like the construction workers. It is a difficult place to undertake such work. We want to see the worst, but often we don't get access to those. There's always a selection bias when it comes to analytic research. So here we profile the physiological and perceived demands of the workers in Hongkong uh, with the means of analyzing the data, but it's not a great trust. Moving north, Vietnam, this time in collaboration with the Vietnam Medical Military University. Vietnam to undertake such work, right? You need to understand the key local and labor support. And also tapping on their next work, we observe shoe making factory workers. Mostly females working with thermal press machinery tests. Machine that went above 170 degrees Celsius. We have actually submitted a welcome trust proposal in order to take this further. To look at the impact with and without interventions on these block workers. One group I want to highlight by the a photo here is in South Korea. This is very interesting and frightening. We profile delivery workers. At times during their shift, workers experience physiological strain that is comparable to an ultra marathon. Above 38 degrees Celsius, above 120 minutes. Ultra marathon do a race once, probably a few times per year. 
these workers do their job every day. Now, paid by fees, I think there's a key difference there. Health will be compromised for sure for your information and data and this job every year. So small differences and increases in the tropics are enough to create human health and performance. My worry is each time we talk about this topic in Southeast Asia, the residents you know, will respond other than thermally uncomfortable. They will say it's always hot, it's still hot, it's a bit hotter. So what's the big deal? Boiling frogs and allergy is also a topic here. So therefore, and I urge more, uh, more work must be done with great agents, uh, great urgency in Southeast Asia. Thank you. <laughs> That's where we have a box. So either this gentleman is too lazy to walk or there is a false positive product for us of people. Because it can't be uh, you know, uh, unproductive as any typical work. All work days cannot be as unproductive or as you know, hot that it could make somebody uh, unproductive. But this must be a false forecast. This has nothing to do with my uh, present time in my talk. I just wanted to make you realize that uh, we have advanced. Like, uh, people predictions have advanced a lot. We uh, are. <coughs> For example, today itself in India. So I am a VM. I work for NRDC, and uh, I come from India. And today, uh, officially, first March. I mean, India. It, it, it's first March now. We, our meteorology department, has announced the seasonal forecast for the summer months. Uh, summer months, summer season this year, March, April, May, June. And it is obviously expected uh, hotter than usual. And predictions of heat waves in several parts of India are there. Good part is that. This has been taken into the consideration now. I'll also go with the numbers. Uh, we'll talk about the numbers, billions of, you know, since we are talking about the global realities of heat. Uh, so in India also, like billions of people, I mean, uh, people are exposed to billions of more days to uh, extreme heat com as compared to earlier years. I'm talking about the figures from the Lancet. Uh, by 2030, there will be more than 30 million people uh, and uh, I mean, jobs which will be lost because of extreme heat, stress that extreme heat will put, and people will not be able to, you know, work productively, and that's uh, that is what will cause the losses of job. Uh, hundreds of thousand people will die because of extreme heat. In fact, already dying if we go by the, the attribution of the lens with, uh, uh, studies. Uh, so yeah, there is an correlate for humanity, which uh, and health, which recently uh, Lancet announced and even the Secretary General of UN also announced. But uh, of all these number, why did we miss the gross reality? What is this? Can anybody tell me what is this? Anyone? I mean, the code rate was announced in, announced in 2021, but what is this? I'll not take too much of your time. Uh, this is a real notice. I have taken a screenshot of a news video uh, that covered a story around heat wave that happened in 2015 in South Asia. This is from Pakistan, Karachi, our neighbor country. And this was outside the mortuary. I couldn't put the pictures or the video. It was so disturbing of what happened in 2015 heat wave there. So, that is so disturbing. Like we can go by these numbers, but how can we miss the harsh reality that not just COVID, even heat wave can create situations that you will see ambulances running around the streets, you know, across the roads, and you will see piles of bodies in the mortuaries, uh, outside the mobs waiting for to be, you know, uh, eliminated. This could be very disturbing. That that's the harsh reality that I want to explain here. But good part is. Uh, Good part is that with the help of Global Heat Health Information Network and with the help of, you know, uh, heat action plans and heat health warning systems, cities and states and countries are putting effort. 
but in singular efforts, you know, local tailor made efforts of raising public awareness, this is the gentleman uh, in Ahmedabad back, I, I think this picture was taken back in 2015, a gentleman reading the billboards, which had do's and don'ts of what should be done during extreme heat, a common man, right? Uh, people accessing the, uh, the, the facilities made available by the authorities, like drinking water, which is so essential when you, you know, advise people to drink water, you should have, you should, you should ensure the authorities should ensure that the availability of water is there for all the marginalized people and not just those you know short term public awareness community outreach and interagency coordination measures but also the long term or uh, uh, measures like mitigation measures like kulu a low cost cheap uh, measures like kulu and i think uh, you know I, I just talked about this in the initial uh, initial uh, part itself that now we have moved from uh, from warnings during the heat waves to seasonal, you know, warnings and taking these steps uh, before and rather than working at the, the last moment. But yeah, so this is in crux. Uh, I wanted to share that uh, there is no doubt that heat wave is one of heat wave is the only hazard that there is no doubt that it that has gone exaggerated and will exaggerate because of the climate change. Uh, but we have a larger task on our and is to assess the impact of heat wave. So time has gone to you know understand the just the heat wave, but also to assess the impact of heat waves on different vulnerabilities, so that we can have a better dialogue on loss and damage. <coughs> Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Greetings, everyone. Uh, my name is Shubha Yusaha. I am from the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Many, like the mother, uh, you know, like the lady that you see in this photograph, uh, you know, live in parts of the city, live in parts of cities in the United States that are significantly hotter than other areas in the city. Decades of <laughs> discriminatory housing and development policies that have targeted neighborhoods of low income and individuals of color have been linked with these urban heat islands that are often 10 degrees Fahrenheit hotter than other parts of the city. Lack of trees, poor housing quality, and ability to afford air conditioning or pay utility bills are a few of the other realities that put individuals living in these neighborhoods at high risk of heat related illness. We know that the frequency, intensity, and duration of heat waves will increase as a result of climate change. The heat dome over the Pacific Northwest in 2021 was a grim reminder of the human toll associated with heat waves. When unprecedented number of people fell in and died across the states of California, Oregon, and Washington, as well as across you know, the northern border in British Columbia. And unfortunately, we experienced multiple heat waves each year in every part of the country, putting millions at risk uh, from adverse health consequences. Surveillance data from the National Emergency Medical Services collected over the past few summers in the United States show that a majority of heat-related calls were reported from a residence of the person suffering from these uh, heat exposures. So there are programs across the federal and state governments that are currently being leveraged to reduce the health risks that at-risk individuals face from extreme heat. For example, the Department of Health and Human Services provide financial assistance to low-income families to meet their residential energy bills, thus allowing them to continue using cooling equipment during heat waves. Some states in the country are allowing individuals with certain medical conditions that increase their health risks if exposed to high heat to use their health insurance to install fans or air conditioners in their homes. Other programs related to residential energy efficiency and weatherization are being made available for at-risk families in order to make indoor environments safer places to live in during a heat wave. Additionally, providing actionable heat health information is also essential in mobilizing resources at the local level for implementing programs that protect who we consider to be vulnerable during an extreme heat episode. The Health and Human Services Office of Climate Change and Health Equity is publishing a climate and health outlook that provides advanced information of impending heat days a month in advance. The outlook is published at the beginning of the month and shows a map identifying counties expected to experience a high number of extremely hot days, as well as characteristics of the population in those counties that could make them vulnerable to the potential heat. 
The United States Centers for Disease Control leverages health surveillance data to share real-time heat illness information. Through an online tool called the CDC Heat and Health Tracker, daily heat-related emergency department visit information is shared that informs preparedness and response efforts during an ongoing heat wave. CDC is collaborating with the National Weather Service and NOAA to incorporate health information in the issuance of heat warnings. Calibrating the warnings with the local patterns of heat, as well as adding epidemiologic information on adverse health impacts associated with those extreme heat conditions. <coughs> CDC also supports state and local health departments through the Climate Ready States and Cities Initiative. This initiative focuses on building capacity and preparing and responding to the health threats from climate change, specifically for the communities considered to be at high risk. Among the different initiatives that local health departments have with respect to vulnerable populations and extreme heat, there are campaigns and collaborations with schools to increase awareness of heat risk among children, as well as assisted living facilities to reduce the heat health risk among the elderly population. The health challenges from extreme heat are real and it affects every part of the country. This administration recognizes extreme heat as a societal challenge and has established an all of government approach through the Interagency Extreme Heat Resilience Working Group. The National Integrated Heat Health Information System that exists since 2015 as an interagency partnership supports the implementation of many of these working group priorities. Thank you so much and uh, look forward to the questions. So we are using the mic. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Um, thanks. So, so I'm Shari Kovacs. So I'm at the London School of Hygiene and Topical Medicine. Um, and I'm going to show a video as well as do my talk. And I'm going to talk about the results from our China project, which is climate heat and maternal and neonatal health in Africa. Um, so this is one of the outputs of our project. So I'm primarily going to talk about the field work that's been done on the Okay, so we, we've obviously looked at a range of epidemiological evidence. There's very good evidence that maternal or pregnant women um, and birth outcomes, um, there are adverse risks linked to high temperature, particularly for preterm birth and stillbirth, but also risks to, to neonates and newborns as well, which are very, have very limited capacity to thermoregulate. But what I'm going to talk about today is more the lived reality. So this is from field work that was led by, um, there she is, Adelaide Lusan, Dr. Adelaide Lusambili, who was at Agra Khan University in Kenya, and also Dr. Kadia Tukadi, who is based at IRSS in Burkina Faso. So they interviewed women, but also their family members, their husbands, their mother-in-laws, community health workers, and community leaders um, over several months about their experiences of heat. So we're going to talk about how the heat impacts the pregnancy, how the heat impacts for childbirth, and how he impacts the postpartum period as well. But um, as Jason said, you know, this community is experienced, used to experience heat, so heat's very normalized. So there was a lot of what, what's not a, a total lack of awareness about the risk to health and maternal health and babies from the high temperatures, and then kind of understanding about why it wasn't seen as something you could do much about. But the women report, you know, he has a double burden. So when they're, they're pregnant, they still have a lot of, um, especially in the low resource centers, I should say. So the urban and rural communities had high levels of, of poverty. So been continuing, women, many women were continuing to work right until late, very late in pregnancy. So he was seen as a double burden. So they had to cope with the pregnancy and the heat on top of it. Um, had they also report problems sleeping, um, increases in anxiety, and stresses at home as well. So increased stress on relationships and a whole kind of range of um, impacts on their well-being. And then we also asked about coping strategies and a range of coping strategies we used for cooling. But some of these become limited when they're uh, the women are pregnant as well because they're, they're they're less allowed to sort of sleep outside, um, and they um, also constrained about when they can work during the day as well. And the population in Kenya, they have a, a drought. So there was very water, they had water restrictions. So they couldn't shower and do kind of normal mechanisms for, for cooling down. So it's very important to consider the 
you know, how you live with heat as well as all these other environmental hazards that people are having, having to deal with. So heat impacts also on childbirth. So the women report, you know, how uncomfortable it is to try and give delivering, even when, if, when they're delivering at birth facilities or health facilities. A lot of the health facilities, again, do not have cooling space. They don't have shade. So it makes women reluctant to stay within the health facilities. So heat clearly can impact women, pregnant women, from accessing health services. They may not want to attend their antenatal appointments if they have far to walk, for example. And that has implications because good maternal health requires good access to and, and near access to services. So we also talked to women about the, in the postpartum period. Um, and again, heat, um, they report quite a lot of um, stress and difficulty, trouble sleeping and exhaustion. And also the babies are quite distressed. So mothers and babies. Um, breastfeeding can be difficult. Or it's not so pleasant when it's really hot, uncomfortable for the child as well as for the mother. Um, and we also did another a, a quantitative study on maternal behaviour and found that in Burkina Faso, at very high temperatures, the time spent breastfeeding declines. There's also a very strong perception that when it's very hot, um, the babies may be dehydrated, which leads some women to supplement breastfeeding. And of course, supplementation also has a risk to health because there's a risk of um, contamination. So what we found overall is that there's a, a general lack of awareness, but this means there's also an opportunity. So within this project, we've done um, a lot of co-design so talking to the communities about what interventions are possible. And for um, so this video is part of the intervention that's uh, used to communicate with the pregnant women in Kilifi. And there are other sort of visual tools and visual aids and communication that's used in Burkina Faso. And we're currently hoping to get our findings soon about how the, these um, how feasible these interventions are. Thank you. Analysts. Sorry for the mic, no mic confusion, but I guess we've got it settled now. Um, so we had a really nice tour all the way from some of the cascading impacts to the military, which is a really important point, especially in the US. We're working with our military as well. Um, just the harsh realities. Shubayu, thank you for the, the US perspective and CDC and, and Shari, the maternal and child health issues. I know there's a, a very large and active global working group and network on maternal and child health specifically. So um, thank you to the panelists, I think, uh, for giving us a little bit of a world tour. Uh, that was the objective. So we will thank you very much and um, transition on to the next panel. Lad, this one's yours. So now we're, we're going, you've got a little bit of the solution space in there as they were speaking, um, but this, this next section, we're going to hand it over to Lad to take us through a little bit more on the solutions across timescales. So Lad, thank you. Great. Maddie, can you come up really quickly? <laughs> and if I could have Julia Ricky and... Let's see here. Up, oh, thank you. Perfect. And Ollie J, join me. <clears throat> so, what we have now is the first of two panels. And again, this is focused more on the solution space. So, again, we have Julie and Ollie who will speak to preparing communities for extreme heat. So, I'll turn it over to Julie first. Hi, everyone. Really lovely to be here um, talking about heat, a topic that's a very high on the priority of the International Red Cross Red Crescent and, of course, on the um, priority of all of us, and that's why we're here. Um, so my few minutes here are on the community preparedness perspective. And for that, I'm going to focus on two quick areas. And these are areas that I think are really key to um, basically growing community preparedness. So one is on the case making side. And so while all of us are here and we're you know all committed to the topic of heat action, there's still a case making uh, importance that happens not only at the individual level, but also the institutional level. 
So for that, I mean things like um, research at a local level about heat impacts, whether that's health impacts, excess mortality impacts, economic impacts. Uh, from our perspective, we find that very useful uh, when we're talking about our local offices, uh, collaborating with local government counterparts, for example, to make the case of why extreme heat should be a priority among the hundreds of other priorities that people are dealing with every day. One example of some work that we've done recently with um, Jin uh, is this is an effort around fostering heat research in areas where there tends to be less heat research funding. And so you can see here a map of what was 15 researchers across approximately 13 countries who are all looking at different aspects of um, either thresholds and impacts or risk perception among uh, individual community um, cohorts, different types of community cohorts. By that, I mean like outdoor workers or folks living in informal settlements or other various uh, types of um, shared community interests. And some also some researchers looking at things on the um, more on the policy or um, uh, sort of like infrastructure perspective, I guess, for lack of a better word. By that, I mean, there's one that did a group on, there was one researcher that did a piece of research on basically urban heat islands that uh, fell, fell into that other category. So you can see here um, quite a large spread across a variety of countries and some really exciting research that came out of that. Really encourage you to take a look at that if you haven't already. It's on the preparecenter.org website, which you can see the web address for there. Then the other uh, big priority for these few minutes is the concept of scaling local action globally, which is a huge need and a huge challenge because of the number of local communities that there exist. And so from this, from our perspective, it's really key that the approach to that is very human centered in the way that it's developed. And I can think of a couple of different areas to highlight under that topic. So one is um, really understanding the unique vulnerability and exposure of folks who are um, part of community preparedness efforts. So that could be, for example, um, understanding the communication needs or the service needs of older populations or people with pre-existing health uh, um, conditions or folks who are less socially connected than others and how you reach them and make sure that they're receiving the right messages when they need them, et cetera. Uh, and then there's an element of their risk perception, which I spoke a little bit about on the research side, but even if someone has heightened risk, they may not internalize that heightened risk. So understanding that and how to communicate towards that heightened risk to try and increase the chances of action to reduce risk are really key. And then the other space is thinking about all of the services and resources that they will need during that moment of extreme heat. So for example, um, access to cooler spaces, uh, things like cooling centers or cooling shelters. We had an interesting example from the American Red Cross domestically where cooling shelters during the Pacific Northwest heat wave um, were very widely used because people were able to stay overnight. It was what we presume. Um, or access to green spaces, the case of Paris where everyone in the city is a seven minute walk. Some of you heard me say that yesterday, I think is a very cool uh, example. And considerations for those who are unhoused. So you can see in the middle of this uh, of these pictures, uh, the French Red Cross there during a heat wave is handing out water to someone who is um, unhoused. And that relates also um, to the water access services and avoiding shutoffs or supplementing access to water when it's um, underserved locations. There's a health access dimension as well, whether that's scaling emergency health services or equipping community health workers with um, the knowledge they need. So our Global First Aid Reference Center, which is also part of the Red Cross system, uh, is undertaking some work about how to um, enhance its first aid uh, guidance to community health workers or others as well. There's referral systems too. So the picture on the right here is a volunteer with the Australian Red Cross. Uh, who is making a phone call during an extreme event. Um, it's actually multi-hazard. It was founded based on extreme heat. I don't know which extreme event this is for this picture, but people who are particularly vulnerable and potentially in need of emergency services during an extreme event um, register with uh, the Australian Red Cross and then they call and check on them twice a day um, and refer to emergency services if needed. Um, and then I'll just briefly, there are other dimensions, employment, access, for example, and I'll just briefly mention what's going on in the left here and then conclude, which is that um, 
this is actually a picture of the Vietnam Red Cross. Uh, actually, the person who's from the Vietnam Red Cross, I think, is off screen in the way this picture got cropped. But basically discussing with some with an outdoor vendor um, during an extreme heat episode about their risks. And they had an interesting piece of work as well around anticipatory action where they actually took mobile buses, turned them into cooling centers and moved them around the city for a few hours uh, in different locations so that street vendors would have a spot to take a break and cool off during an extreme heat episode. Um, so all of these are types of things around the, the community preparedness perspective. And of course, the long-term Resilience building is really key and our colleague mentioned that already and there's a lot of work going on uh, around that in the Red Cross Red Crescent system as well, but I'll save that if there's a question because I'm out of time. Okay, um, thanks very much for the opportunity to talk today. Um, I don't look like that anymore, but um, my name is Ollie Jay. I'm from the University of Sydney. I'm just gonna start off very quickly describing a new initiative that we have at the University of Sydney in the Faculty of Medicine and Health, which I have the privilege of directing, which is the new Heat and Health Research Incubator. So this is a new dedicated research center to heat and health matters that serves as a multidisciplinary platform for researchers from a variety of different backgrounds and disciplines to come together to generate comprehensive sol solutions to these very complex problems that we face in the context of the effects of heat and hot weather on uh, human health and well-being across the human lifespan. We're starting off our research activities in the first two years centered around five priority research themes which are detailed in this schematic right here. So I'll just quickly summarize them. Climate change and health, heat and health policy, built in environment and health, women's health, and physical and mental well-being. And you can see a few dot points below each of those categories to give you an example of some of the things that we're working on within the research incubator in our first couple of years. Um, today, I'm gonna to talk about solutions a little bit. So we've had a lot of discussion about early heat wave warning systems. Um, we can have thresholds and we can tell people that a heat wave is coming and of a certain severity. But the core question is, what do we tell them to do to mitigate that risk once the heat wave arrives and how do they prepare to for that particular event so our particular approach to this is that nested within the heat and health research incubator is uh, another um, entity that i direct it's called the thermal ergonomics laboratory which is now housed in the beautiful new susan wakel health building which you can see on the left of the screen on the top floor there and within the laboratory you have a custom built state-of-the-art climate chamber. And that's being built with the specific uh, requirements so that we can simulate the peak conditions of any heat wave that has been recorded in the past that we have temperature and humidity for. We also have the capacity to simulate heat waves of the future so we can demonstrate the impacts of acute heat exposure of the future following different carbon emission pathways. But the thing that's most pertinent to today's talk is that we use this particular facility to systematically assess the efficacy of different personal level cooling strategies that can be applied by the most vulnerable in low resource environments in different types of heat waves. The way in which we do this is that we simulate these heat extremes, we expose human participants to these conditions, and we measure physiological markers of the physiological heat strain that evolves during that heat exposure that is ultimately responsible for heat related illness and ultimately if it was allowed to develop for many days potentially death and we invite participants to participate in these studies from a variety of different physiological profiles and clinical profiles these are of course also very um, medically supervised as well so we measure how hot they get how much work their heart has to do to keep cool and how dehydrated they become what kind of strain their kidneys are experiencing etc cetera, etc cetera. so we use these as outcome measures and see if we can use certain interventions to reduce how hot people get and use that evidence to support the guidance that we're providing with our heat wave guidance so i had the privilege of co-chairing alongside uh, my good colleague chris ebay who's at the university of washington she might be online today um the lancet series on heat and health which was published in 2021 and one of those particular uh, papers which i had the privilege of leading 
we sought to synthesize all of the existing physiological evidence supporting the efficacy of these different simple cooling strategies. Now, some of these cooling strategies might not be relevant in certain situations. I'm reflecting on Shari's um, uh, presentation, for example, but I think this is relevant in a lot of urban settings indeed. So, and there are also um, significant limitations to the use of these different interventions under certain conditions. We've done a lot of work on electric fans, for example. One thing that we have learned is that they work really well up to around about 39 degrees Celsius. But once you get to the type of conditions that Gregory, Gregory was describing in the um, BC heat wave, then they're actually accelerating body heating, rapidly increasing the rate of dehydration and the develop of, development of cardiovascular strain. So these are available infographics that are on the Lancet website, and we invite anybody who's interested in using them to use them to um, uh, translate the information that is available in this particular literature. Something that we were excited about as well was the opportunity to have these translated to different um, uh, languages. So we have them now in Hindi and also in Spanish, and we're looking at trying to get these um, translated to other languages as well to widen the uptake of this particular information. One thing that is worth acknowledging is that this work is done in a climate chamber environment. And what it does, it enables us to generate early data to understand which ones work and which ones do not. But in order to really understand the optimal cooling strategies, what we can do is use this technique to actually understand the best candidates for wide scale clinical trials. And this is the next step that we're facing with our particular work. So at the Heat and Health Research Incubator at the University of Sydney, we are right now establishing partnerships both domestically and internationally to established field-based clinical trials to assess how well these candidate cooling strategies work in real world heat waves, in real people living through these particular events. And we'll be very happy to speak to anybody who's interested in partnering with us on that work. And that's me, thank you very much. Great, thank you, Ali, and uh, you can actually both stay up here because you'll be part of the Q and A afterwards. And if I could have uh, Jason Lee rejoin us along with uh, Juanita Constable and Hunter Jones, and Jason, you can kick us off. The second panel is on protecting communities for a hotter future. Testing one, two, three. It's, it's me again. Yeah, so I've been asked to talk briefly about uh, the work on protecting workers. And then the second part would be the investments at my end on this area of work. In five minutes, I'll keep within the time this time. Uh, yes, become. It has become clear that we need a transdisciplinary approach to tackle this wicked issue that affects the whole society. Uh, we ought to see and approach big problems of the society in tandem. Resources are always finite. Yeah, so while we continue to work in heat health, be aware there are other big problems in the society. Some are related to our work. For example, aging society. And we know that they might be compromised in certain ways uh, in face of heat, you know, and therefore see them in tandem. As global temperature continue to rise, climate change will cause serious issues of existing problems. And in my area of work, you will definitely undermine labor productivity in many vocations and therefore creating new challenges. And so a couple of initiatives from my end, uh, you see Project Heat Safe. I talk about it briefly. Uh, is capacity building in this region, in Southeast Asia. Uh, we are strong believer that the residents have to take care of their own people. So building the capacities within each region is critical. The second one on the bottom right is the International Commission of Occupational Health specifically. Uh, it is a scientific committee called Thermal Factors. This platform allows us to ensure not just interventions, but hopefully evidence-based interventions. It's a group of active research and analysis network of dedicated scientists working in all sectors in occupational health, in both heat and coal. So 
I extend a invitation for those who are in this area of work to consider being part of this scientific committee. A few key messages from this committee. And number one, optimal safety does not compromise, but at times enhances work productivity. And often we go to the stakeholders and say, I know what you're saying, you know, you could ask me to slow them down and therefore I will compromise in work productivity. No. I know we are saying that you should protect their health and therefore you get the most out of your workers for their good and for your good. Solutions are there, but be careful. Use them correctly. Something that's being said a thousand times sometimes may not be evidence-based. His stress can induce more than just heat injuries and performance degradation. In occupational setting, we are particularly interested to quantify the impact on heat compromising decision-making leading to accidents. So coming to my second and final part, I'm very pleased you know, to announce the new Heat Resilience and Performance Center launched last month in the National University of Singapore. HRPC in short seeks to serve as a regional node tapping on local and global expertise to move these common mandates that we are talking about and discussing this afternoon. Briefly, you know, there are three trusts being organized in this uh, new center. In the Discovery Trust, we want to build a database through the aggregation and analysis of existing and emerging data. Moving ahead, every question shouldn't be tackled by the new experiments. Sometimes the stakeholders want an interim answer for immediate problems. So we've done a lot of work, not just us, many around the world. With data science, we believe we can give an interim answer and therefore experiments can happen subsequently to validate. In the detect trust, we want to see physiology and make decision. And finally, in the strengthen trust, we want to explore advanced technology, materials, techniques, including other disciplines to undertake this uh, field. If I may, right, I just, you know, I should stop talking and use this video to depict what HRPC is about so I can end the presentation. Hopefully that is sound. If not, I will scream for Mandy's help again. Mandy, there's no sound. Yeah. Oh. Oh. Can I? Yeah, there are subtitles at the bottom. You can read it. Yeah, so we do have a uh, physical set out, you know, but uh, it's important to you know to create replicates of this around the regions, you know, so they can un 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 uh, undertake such work use in their specific context. So here you see, you know, uh, we ought to, even in lab study, design it with higher ecological validity, not just pressing the space bar to assess cognitive function. That is AR, uh, mixed reality, VR, we can harness of these enablers to answer all questions. So this is trust to seeing physiology, but more importantly, not just to measure the physiology, but to sense make accordingly. So the Ministry of Defense has made a huge investment to inaugurate this uh, new center, but this is not just to serve the military. Uh, it is an uh, investment by them, but it is to augment uh, human lives in the society. That's the climatic chamber. So here, you know, it's not a place we want to undertake work on our own. We want to harness on existing network. Here you see alliance of medical school within the network. So there's no need to rebuild a new network. It's finding which are the critical nodes, leverage on them and extend them accordingly. This is a new facility that will be built, a thousand square meter allocated uh, to do lab work. 
So I briefly mentioned this already, discover, detect, and strengthen. And in the video, it briefly elaborates what is the aim under each of these three trusts. I like the final sentence in this video. There you go. Even as temperatures rise, we can rise above it. Thank you. I know how to do this now, Matt. <laughs> All right, so next up. Yep, we'll take care of it. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, although now it's gone. Where did it go, Maddie? Up oh, there it is. Perfect. Okay, so with that, um, I'll turn it over to Hunter Jones with Noah. Thank you, Lad. Hi, everyone. I am uh, the program manager for the National Integrated Heat Health Information System uh, at NOAA, and we have a number of other agency partners as well. And I'm going to cover two, uh, two things that we've done, two new kind of innovative approaches to uh, reach local communities and to promote heat action. The first one is uh, NIHIS has for many years conducted uh, urban heat island mapping campaigns in a, as a citizen science initiatives. So we've been doing this, uh, it started in NOAA and other parts of NOAA, but we've been doing it consistently since about 2017 in uh, over 60 communities now across the United States. And we've also reached two communities in other countries. And what this project is, is essentially we empower local community members and community leaders to take environmental sensors, temperature, humidity, air quality, and to uh, drive around on motorcycles, cars, et cetera, with these sensors attached to collect data that can be fed into models and used to create maps of their urban heat islands. And this is really important because it not only uh, brings in a lot of community members and allows them to get observations from where they're living and to create data sets that help inform decisions that will affect them, uh, but it also, it, it promotes action and it creates sort of a, a moment in time when people are, are taking these observations, uh, gets a lot of journalistic coverage, and it really creates an incentive for people to act. And so you can see in these images here on the left, we have uh, a picture of the campaign that was run in Sierra Leone uh, in Freetown where we, uh, we have uh, volunteers that are attaching sensors to a bike. In the center, you can see an, a map of Charleston, South Carolina where we have um, conducted our mapping activities and where uh, that's just one of the outputs of, of that campaign. And on the right, you can see in the environmental justice angle of this. So you can see a, a bar chart showing the difference in temperature between uh, some of the disadvantaged neighborhoods as, uh, as labeled disadvantaged by the uh, CEQ, the, the White House uh, Climate and Envi uh, Environmental Justice, Economic Justice Screening Tool. Uh, and that, that, dedicate, that classifies neighborhoods as uh, disadvantaged or not disadvantaged. And you can see in Charleston, uh, the disadvantaged neighborhoods were actually almost a, a degree Fahrenheit uh, height hotter than the not disadvantaged neighborhoods. So real evidence is coming from these, uh, these campaigns. Uh, once you've got that, that catalyst to act, um, there are more steps that you can take. And one of the other things that we're doing that we're really excited about, and this is part of a program that's being implemented by a lot of different partners inside of NOAA and outside of NOAA, is heat tabletop exercises. Tabletop exercises have been used uh, for a lot of other hazards, but I think as we're all familiar, heat is one of those hazards that has typically not been addressed in the same way as other hazards, and we're trying to change that. We're trying to raise the profile of heat and make it, make it clear that this is a really important hazard for us to address. These tabletop exercises, and we're running them in Las Vegas, that one's already happened. Phoenix just happened last week. Charleston and Miami are, are still to come. These tabletop exercises allow us to stress test existing plans and to inform uh, creation of new plans to manage heat risk in these communities. 
And uh, one of the nice things that we're doing about these tabletops is, is not just doing the traditional approach where you kind of focus on the emergency management timescale and heat response and, and uh, sort of preparedness, but rather uh, we're also stretching it into a longer timescale. We're looking at what can you do uh, a month or more out from a heat wave. And then we're also looking at once we've done the tabletop, uh, exploring the resilience timescale. So given the way that the tabletop played out, what could we put in place over the next decade to uh, mitigate those risks and to make the tabletop scenario kind of play out better in the future? So two really quick introductions, but I would love to talk about either of these practices in the future. Happy Tuesday, everyone. I am delighted to be here. My name is Juanita Constable. I am a climate and health advocate with the Natural Resources Defense Council, which means I'm here to yell at you about being advocates. I would argue that despite some of the absolutely great solutions we've heard about today, heat does not get the same kind of attention, the same kind of love from policymakers as other climate hazards like wildfires and floods. And that's partly because it hurts people more than it hurts property. Yes, obviously heat damage the, damages the built environment, but health is where it really happens. And those health damages don't make for good TV and the costs of them are not well quantified in the kinds of cost benefit analysis that can make or break policy decisions. The other problem is the people who are most vulnerable to heat tend to be the least visible to policymakers, either because they can't vote or because they don't have the same kind of political access that the people in this room do. So I'm here to urge you to use your access to do two things. One is to facilitate meaningful dialogue between community members and policymakers, or at least remind policymakers that there are people that are effect being affected personally. Um, Julie from the Red Cross Red Crescent already talked about how much the local context matters. So everything from the hospital system to how reliable the power grid is to the kinds of social cohesion that neighborhoods need to get through a deadly heat wave can make a big difference. And what we see is there's often a huge gap between what communities want and need and what policymakers has decided is important for them. A perfect example of this comes from coastal Texas. A 2021 study looked at hazard mitigation plans of four coastal counties, and they found that 55% of the projects were related to hurricanes and floods. 2% of the projects in Texas were about heat. Now, when somebody actually talked to the communities, heat edged out hurricanes at the top of their worry list. So there's this mismatch, but we've seen it work well in other places. Miami-Dade County just released an extreme heat action plan in, in December. You can tell that they talk to community members because protecting workers is a big part of that plan. And that's where they got a lot of community engagement. The other element is, of course, making sure that all your great cross-disciplinary, cross-sectoral um, research translates into cross-sectoral planning at across government agencies. Um, heat's a health problem, a housing problem, immigration problem, a supply chain problem. I mean, it touches everything, everything that we care about. And we cannot do heat planning in one discipline alone. It can't just live in public health. It can't just live in emergency management. We will fail unless we take a more holistic approach. That's why I'm a huge fan of NIHIS and no, Julian Hunter did not pay me to say that. But I really love how there's this effort to bring together multiple federal agencies to build a nation free from heat related illnesses and deaths. Is that not the best mission statement? Here's the problem. <laughs> NIHIS is not currently formalized in federal law and research has consistently shown that a legal mandate and consistent funding is really critical to climate and health um, adaptation initiatives. So speaking as an NRDC or not as anyone else right now, I really hope that Congress fixes that soon, but other localities should also keep that issue in mind. Here's my call to action. This is gonna sound like a super low bar, but I promise you it works. First of all, talk to policymakers if you're not already doing it. Second of all, ask them, have you thought about heat? That sounds like a low bar, but I'm telling you they're not getting it right now. And I know from firsthand experience that it is a really powerful question. For example, I was talking a couple of weeks ago to some colleagues who are working on reducing greenhouse gas pollution from transportation. Have you thought about heat? I say, 
What do you mean, they say? Well, as the climate gets hotter, how are you going to make sure that riders stay safe? Are there going to be shade structures at the public transportation sites? Are, what kind of environment are people walking through? What are wait times like in the hottest part of the day? If it gets too hot, are people just going to drive and blow your greenhouse gas targets? Oh, they say. I wish I could tell you this question is no longer necessary, but gin, the gin community and its allies have a lot more work to do to socialize heat protections and make sure that policymakers are using science-based solutions. Heat's super easy to ignore because of how it hurts people and who it hurts the most. And I think we need to all step up as advocates to make sure that people can survive and thrive in what is only gonna be a hotter world. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Juanita. Oh, that's okay. And I will wrap uh, up the uh, solution talks with a short uh, presentation on what's called the plan integration for resilient scorecard for heat. And so this uh, segues very much into one, what Anita was talking about, but uh, a lot of the work with the cities that we've done and surveys and interviews have shown that um, even heat planning at the local level is very segmented, not just between uh, emergency management, public health, and those that affect the built environment, but all of those that affect the built environment within, within those disciplines as well. So civil engineering, planning, landscape architecture, architecture too. And so uh, that, that idea is called the network of plans. So it's not just one plan in the community that determines the shape of that uh, built environment of the future, but it's all of those plans working in concert, right? A lot of the times though, we stick those heat solutions into a climate action plan or a heat action plan or shove it into, if you're one of the three cities in the United States, lucky enough to have a chief heat officer, kind of the mandates that's uh, underneath their department, right? Um, but the truth is transportation plans, comprehensive plans, parks and recreation plans, hazard mitigation plans, all play a very important role in determining the shape of the built environment and things as simple as uh, development approval processes for, you know, gas stations, uh, commercial grocery stores, new suburbs, all of those affect the heat island of the future. And so we have to look holistically at the built environment to really reduce that uh, heat, uh, that heat that we're contributing, that's making, of course, climate change, uh, contributing to the impacts of health um, from climate change, right? So the plan integration for resilience scorecard for heat is an, is an approach to help local communities address that. And it was adapted from the original PERS methodology developed for flooding context. And we piloted that uh, PERS for heat with partner communities, thanks to funding from uh, NOAA. And uh, our partner communities that kicked off the project were Baltimore, Boston, Fort Lauderdale, Houston, and Seattle. So geographically spread across the United States to make sure that um, we were looking climatically at uh, different uh, solutions. And then also those were all partner communities in what Hunter was discussing, the NIHA's heat mapping campaign project. So through this project, we determined if heat mitigation policies in each city targeted the areas that had higher heat and also those areas that were more socially vulnerable. And then we published a PERS for Heat guidebook that's available for researchers and practitioners to uh, work on this uh, themselves or in collaboration. And so I won't run through the process, but the idea here is that you assemble up the network of plans. So those plans in the community that are important for the profile of the heat island of the future, you generate the list of applicable policies, and in the guidebook, we lay those all, all out. You score the policies, whether they'll increase, have no effect, or decrease that heat island. You map those policies and planning districts, so we use the United States Census tracts. And then essentially, you create tables, maps, and indexes that you can analyze against, again, that physical vulnerability or that social vulnerability. And then you advance heat resilience through, hopefully in the future, updating those plans to reduce that heat vulnerability. Um, strength and plan integration between those siloed disciplines that I mentioned, and of course share stories with other communities and um, hopefully become part of this broader community working to reduce heat. So we have multiple uh, results from many cities at this point, but I'll uh, just share the PERS for heat results for Boston because they're interesting and positive. Not all of the results were positive for the cities. Um, but with Boston, at least, you can see here in the purple colors on the left-hand side, the darker purple means there's more policy attention to heat mitigation in those census tracts. So darker purple is better for heat mitigation. 
And essentially we found once we did a, a correlation uh, analysis that heat mitigation policies in Boston were significantly correlated with both afternoon temperatures from that NIHIS urban heat island mapping campaign and social vulnerability. But interestingly in Boston, temperature and vulnerability were not always necessarily co-located. So if you were a planner well-intentioned just looking at the heat island map, or just looking at social vulnerability map, you might actually be led astray to uh, target those areas um, that may not actually be the ones that you want to target, right? And so with this project, we've worked with, um, we've kind of expanded the cities that we've been working with. And some of the results, like I mentioned, show that uh, heat mitigation policies are not targeting either the hotter areas or the more socially vulnerable areas. So kind of, again, continuing that unfortunate trend of, uh, you know, racial segregation, poorer neighborhoods, marginalized neighborhoods being hotter, uh, having less investment. And so this is an actual way that you can um, methodologically go through the plan policies and see what your community is actually doing. Um, and again, not just those uh, tree mapping, uh, tree tree campaign, uh, tree planting campaigns or cool uh, corridor pilot projects, but actually looking at all of the decisions in the built environment. So the next steps for PERS for heat at least is, um, like I mentioned, uh, we have at the University of Arizona, we're a partner institution for the Southwest Urban Corridor Integrated Field Laboratory. And that will allow us to do uh, PERS for heat and other plan analysis for the entire Arizona Sun Corridor now, which is a really exciting opportunity for us to see um, how the whole corridor will be developed in the future and how those policies will shape the heat island of that whole uh, state. And uh, uh, the image on the left-hand side is just showing uh, my colleague, Sarah Miro at ASU and I presenting the PERS for heat results to Tempe. And I think through this process, we're not just improving uh, heat resilience, but we're also improving general plan making and improving the quality of plans. And again, just getting people within local governments to talk to each other. And again, not even talking about public health or emergency management, but hazard mitigation planners, urban planners, landscape architects, architects, civil engineers. So, so a lot of uh, silos to break down. And this is a process that brings a lot of folks that are really important to that to the table. So thank you. And with that, we will move into the Q&A. <clears throat> so, um, so yeah, so uh, at this point, we'll move into the Q&A. And I know that uh, I'll point out if you're watching us virtually right now, please do put your questions in. And we have someone that will uh, read those out in a few minutes. But are there any questions in the audience? And we'll have someone run the mic around so that we can hear that online as well. And questions for any of our uh, panelists from the previous uh, presentations. Do you want to? Let's get it started. I'm curious from your perspective, is there one thing that you think is the most emerging or most pressing issue from your perspective that we can be doing as a global network? What are, what are the most emerging issues or one thing you think we could tackle better globally? Yeah, do you want to start, Juanita? Yeah, um, I mentioned that the health costs of heat are not currently well captured in policymaking. That seems like a super high um, priority because without that information, unfortunately, at least in the US, those things will just continue to be ignored. I would say raising the profile of heat. I think we've done a lot of that already as a network, but continuing to do that, making it visible, um, bringing it into decision-making processes at all levels of government, including go global government. Uh, I think there's more work to be done just to make to, to raise the profile of heat. For me, it is what is the equivalent of a heat health warning system in Southeast Asia or in the tropics? Do we need one? or we need one of another kind? I think um, certainly based on the, the presentation that I gave today, um, I think the translation of research findings and making sure that we are informing um, heat health policy with the best available evidence is, um, is a priority. And I'm going to second the um, quantifying health impacts for policy discussions and confirm that it extends beyond the US as well, and that our colleagues um, around the world have exactly the same struggle. And once you can get that, 
the door is open uh, because when you can quantify those impacts, people want to react to that and respond to that and reduce them. But you have to have numbers there to be able to make the case. Yeah, and I'll, I'll answer as well, since I was also a panelist. Um, but I think um, certainly the idea that um, we have three chief head officers again in the United States, so Miami-Dade County, <clears throat> Los Angeles, and Phoenix, um, and uh, several global chief heat officers now. Um, but in the United States alone, we have 19,000 uh, incorporated cities that don't have the resources to pursue having a chief heat officer. So what kind of governance structures, processes, actors, you know, working groups can work in those smaller communities that are just as vulnerable to heat. So I think um, helping out all spectrums of community sizes is really critical. So. Chris, do you want to, oh, do we have one question? I, yeah, no, no, not question, just to add what Jane can do. Uh, is I'll again, uh, you know, echo what Ivanita says that uh, we need to strengthen the extreme heat governance. I mean, until and unless we don't, you know, bring heat into policy, uh, it will be a piecemeal work that we all will be doing here and there. But we have to ensure that heat is a part of governance. There should be, you know, a policy, a, a legislative order a legal backup to the actions that uh, the governments can take. Otherwise, it will always be a piecemeal work. Yeah, thank you. Yes. Yeah, uh, I guess a question for, for Julian and Juanita about uh, how you turn the heads of policymakers and um, encourage them to realize the importance of heat. Uh, putting crudely, money talks. So in terms of when we talk about quantifying impacts are we talking about monetizing and um, monetizing the impacts and articulating clearly the cost to the economy of heat because i think that's the thing that really does open the doors to policymakers if we can say this is costing the economy you know 10 million for example or or whatever I think that's valuable for some policymakers, for sure. I can say for those that the Red Cross, Red Crescent liaises with, which is primarily on the disaster management side or sometimes the health side, um, it is more the excess mortality in particular. Um, the Red Cross uh, or Red Crescent in every country is auxiliary to government, which is sort of this uh, not quite a nonprofit, but also not government either. Um, and so when we are able to highlight extreme numbers of excess mortality in particular and compare that to the other types of hazards that we provide auxiliary services for and how those numbers are so much lower which is often the case then that helps substantially to be able to raise the profile of heat um, and then the subsequent needs to take action especially on that emergency time scale of heat action planning and improving warning systems the resilience building side is super important as well uh, and those conversations can flow thereafter I'm not saying that's for all policymakers, but for the ones that we liaise, liaise with, it's especially excess mortality. I, I do also agree with the excess mortality. It, it, it depends a lot on who you're talking to. And right now, unfortunately, um, you know, for example, I work on worker health, heat health a lot. And those numbers in the US are so such such underestimates that we're not getting we're not even able to communicate the full picture so forget about trying to attach a dollar figure just starting with that true number of workers who are actually affected we do hear a lot though the argument against taking action on heat because a lot of it's very expensive stuff and um, they're not seeing sort of the benefits accruing to that so in addition to monetizing the health harms, doing a better job of illustrating the health benefits and what the dollar figures are attached to that. Great, thank you, Juanita. And we have a question over there. Uh, my name is Elena Ateva. I work primarily on maternal newborn uh, health and primarily outside of the US. I think this is the, the second time I hear air conditioning um, being put forward as a solution. Uh, and I understand immediately, obviously, this is saving lives uh, in developed countries, but obviously cannot be an equitable solution globally. We work primarily in, in regions that are very re low resource. Um, Sin province was mentioned today. Uh, we work, you know, in the province outside of uh, Karachi. Temperatures get regularly over 50, 55. That's about 122, I believe, so, uh, Fahrenheit. 
And uh, what the women are telling us is the solution potentially is solar panels so they can operate uh, their, their fans with it. So I really want to hear what other solutions like that are available or, or before maybe thinking or researching that can truly be equitable uh, around the world. Thank you. Sorry, I, I had a, I was struggling to hear you a little bit there. Can I just confirm that you said using fans at 55 degrees Celsius? Did you say that? All right. You, no, it's, it's, yeah, that would be bad. That, yeah, so that's definitely not the solution. Um, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, so very, do they have water in their environment? Yes. Mm. Yeah. I mean, so so in those types of conditions, the the only way in which you can cool is by either dropping the temperature that's surrounding them, which is challenging and carbon intensive, but also expensive and requires resources. Um, and the other, uh, only other way possible is through evaporation. And that's through getting water of some description on the skin, so then it can then evaporate. That's the way that we cool physiologically through sweating. Um, one of the things that we're looking at as a solution, which is somewhat similar to what you're describing is, a setting where there might not there might be water available, but it's not um, clean enough to drink. And I think one of the speakers mentioned earlier on about um, you know one of the number one things we tell people to do is drink water. But if there's not enough clean water around, you know, is that aggravating um, increases in waterborne diseases, for example, something like this? So we're looking at a solution whereby you can use water that's not clean enough to drink, but it's clean enough to apply to the skin. It then evaporates. You then don't have to sweat as much, and therefore you're indirectly hydrating with water that you can't drink. Um, but that's again, that, that might not be a solution that 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 is uh, appropriate for the setting that you're describing, because it sounds very severe indeed. Yeah, Julia, um, Juanita, do you have any other perspectives on the challenge? Yeah, I mean, I, um, I'm not familiar with that context, but I would say just more generally, um, things like passive cooling and often um, more traditional housing structures in hotter climates obviously uh, have passive cooling already built from many years. Um, the water access piece and uh, is really key. We have, so, all the work that we do is with that local Red Cross or Red Crescent. So it would be by extension, then volunteers who are basically the neighbors of the folks that you're talking about who are facilitating conversations. And so in those instances, um, there will oftentimes be uh, conversations facilitated around um, cultural considerations that can exacerbate risk and how to overcome that. Um, but that's always led by those volunteers who are really also steeped in the understanding of the culture. Um, those are a couple of examples, but I'll pass it over. So one of the things that um, we focus on is in the US is making sure that air conditioners and other cooling devices are as efficient as possible. So there's a real push to get heat pumps into every home. And um, also making sure that the electric grid is clean in the first place. So these are all, they all have to be done together. One of the big challenges we face in the US is that so many people that are terribly vulnerable to heat are renters. And so it's not like you can change these apartment blocks into passive cooling wonders. So we have to figure out some way to make sure that they have some habitable temperature that doesn't require knocking down the entire building. So that's why we're partially focused on efficiency and clean energy. Great, Ali, and then we'll go to Abhyan. I just wanna, seeing that we are talking about air conditioning and try to making it as accessible and as, as, as cheap and clean as possible. Um, one thing that is an is emerging um, method that 
we've demonstrating is working is that you can move air more and chill it less. So if you do have access to air conditioning, you can use it less without sacrificing thermal comfort. So if you have, you can feel exactly the same thermal sensation at a four degrees Celsius air temperature. If you move that air with this simple fan device, and then that means the air conditioning unit, if you set the um, thermostat of the air conditioning unit at four degrees Celsius warmer, it's now turning on at 27 degrees Celsius instead of 23 degrees Celsius. It's turning off late, turning on later in the day, setting off earlier in the day, and it's on for shorter period. And some days, not the kind of the conditions you're describing, might not be on at all. And um, through the modeling studies that we recently published shows that it could reduce electricity consumption for cooling by as much as 70%. And uh, the greenhouse gas abatement cost analysis showed that that was a better intervention um, than changing all of our uh, lighting from incandescent light bulbs to LED lighting 10 years ago. So there is some hope in that respect. Um, Great. I'll be and then I think we have a question uh, online that we'll- Just wanted to. to add, actually, Julie already covered that passive cooling mechanisms. I don't know how hot, uh, uh, how much it will work in the hotter conditions that you are mentioning, but in in most of the western part of the India, uh, where we are currently working, so we started with uh, the state of Gujarat, which is in western part, and again, uh, currently we are working with the state of uh, Rajasthan. Uh, in tier two cities, we are working on these passive cooling mechanisms with women-led, you know, our partners, which is a women-led, uh, uh, you know, slum uh, household women-led organization. And they're applying these uh, passive cooling solutions, which help them reduce the indoor temperature by, you know, four to five degrees Celsius. But apart from this, there is a component of awareness also associated with it. So when such, you know, measures are applied at the community level, the level of awareness that increases in population that, I mean, in the, in the communities that also plays a role in averting the risk of extreme heat in those communities. So first thing is we need to inform people um, and then, you know, provide them the possible solutions then that they also might have traditionally or we can provide you know as as governments great thank you let's go to the question online sure um this one i think is is aimed towards hunter and asking if you could speak a little bit more about how heat island uh data is best used in planning or hazard preparedness given that it is just one indicator amongst many or it is, and, and there are also different kinds of urban heat island uh, data sets that you can get. And so it really, uh, as with all things, it kind of depends on what you're trying to do. And so I think a lot of communities have uh, land surface temperature based urban heat island data. Uh, and that's useful if you want to modify the land surface temperature, which is the, you know, if you put your hand on the, the concrete sidewalk or something, that's the temperature you would feel. And so if you're interested in uh, cool surfaces implementation, then that might be a useful parameter. Uh, one of the things that's nice about the project that we're running, the citizen science project, is that it also generates uh, air temperature and uh, humidity data so we can calculate heat index. Uh, and that's useful for other things such as uh, tree planting and, and greening solutions. And so it really depends on uh, the kind of intervention you want to take. And those are both kind of uh, external as well. So there, there's a whole host of other um, data sets that would support other kinds of decision making that you would want to do. Yeah, good. Are there any more online questions? Uh, yeah, we can do another one. Um, this one, I guess, is is more targeted towards you, Lad. Uh, specifically, have you seen differing um, use of the PIR uh, tool in smaller communities, or can you speak to kind of you know expanding this focus beyond just like? high population urban areas, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. So again, we selected the cities based on the NIHIS heat mapping campaign and wanted to get that geographic diversity, but we have um, continued to expand it. And um, one of the partner communities we worked with was Kent, Washington, which isn't a small community, but it is certainly smaller and understudied um, compared to its counterparts like Seattle, Washington, right? And so, so I think that's kind of the next phase of the project is, um, seeing specifically how um, how it can help those uh, communities with less resources. And I think we found that it actually works exactly the same as it does for a larger city. Um, in some ways, they actually had more policies than some of the larger cities did. So, so I think um, it, it's very applicable regardless of community size. Any other questions in the audience? Yeah, we have one back there. So we'll get the mic over to you so we can all hear the question. Hello. Um, I had a, it, 
I acknowledge that this is going to be a difficult question, so no worries. Um, but I was wondering if you all encountered potential solutions to um, providing the services and resources that certain populations need in terms of when they're dealing with extreme heat, if they're also being um, discriminated against in terms of like policies at the local state or uh, national level. And so I'm referring specifically to like LGBTQ plus populations. Um, specifically in the US, we've seen uh, an uptick of about 340 anti-LGBTQ plus bills introduced in state legislators. Which, yeah, And they're also overrepresented in populations at higher risk um, for extreme heat, um, higher exposure, specifically for those who are unhoused, um, as well as uh, less likely to actually reach out to um, health providers um, in fear of discrimination. And so just wondering um, whether or not if that's something that you've encountered in your work. Yeah, Hunter or Juanita or Julie. I'll, I'll just start with a with a quick one, which is uh, when we when we've done these tabletops, uh, as well as the urban healing mapping campaigns. Uh, one of the things that's really important to do is, of course, involve members from those communities. And um, you you can't just parachute in and, and just reach out and want to you know immediately engage with people and expect people to come and, and meet you. Um, I think there's a long process of building trust, building relationships that you have to go through first. And in many cases, um, a good way to do that is to work with and through community-based organizations that already have the trust and relationships with communities that you're really interested in uh, working with. And so that's something that we've been able to do. And so that's a, a strong recommendation that I would have. You actually have me wondering now if there is, so we know from the research that LGBTQ plus populations do not show up at hurricane shelters often because they're concerned about not feeling welcome. I'm really curious if that happens with cooling shelters too, and I honestly don't know the answer. So I'm just gonna leave it there, throw out a question. Julie? Yeah, I'm, I'm wondering the same question also. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask some colleagues that work domestically because I don't actually know. Um, and other than that, I would say, although it's not specific to the population that you've mentioned, we do take similar strategies internationally. Um, uh, a different form of uh, a different type of population is, for example, those who live in informal settlements. That's more of a geographic type of um, uh, consideration. But in an urban context, uh, those geographic areas can often be quite marginalized because um, they're often not legal. Um, and so on the Red Cross side, we will facilitate those connections with local government and uh, folks that are in those communities, either to help them um, get mapped because sometimes they're not even on the official maps or advocate for um, services. They're often underserved as well. So it's it's not a perfect, it's not the right example, but um, it is a very interesting question. I'm gonna follow up on it. Great, thank you. Yeah, very important question. Um, any other questions from the audience or online? Okay, one more Another one online. from the online participants, thanks. Um, this one I think is geared more towards uh, maybe Jason or Ali uh, asking about heat health warning systems, specifically talking through the benefits of a personalized heat health warning system that where individuals are warned based on their own health or social conditions and how that could benefit populations versus uh, a, a more broad ranging kind of uh, heat health early warning system. Yeah, uh, my, my perspective is Prospectively, I think tapping on the proliferations of IoT and wearables, that once we sense the environmental heat stress, it should be fused to your personal response to that particular heat stress. And therefore, the advisory should be very specific. I think in that way, then we can get more traction that people will believe that advisory following a certain threshold is useful. If not right now, especially in my context, we are very worried about issuing any kind of warning system because if we lose that confidence, you know, this young man, you tell him that 35 degrees Celsius is going to be dangerous. He look at you and say, no, it's, I'm fit. I have huge capacity. And after the few runs, they might lose confidence. You know? So I think prospectively, if we can, and again, it's not one size fit all, it's all context context, context. If you have a wearable, then that options, that specificity can be made to you. If you don't have other options, must be made, a little, uh, made as options. So if 
I, you ask me, I think the way to hit is moving towards a personalized heat health warning system. Yeah. So um, I can share some quickly some work that we're doing uh, with the government of New South Wales in, in Australia. Um, so we're developing a, an, an app that enables people. So it doesn't require wearables, um, but it does give people an opportunity to interact with um, a heat stress scale and then it will individualize your own individual risk based on certain risk factors that you'll populate within that particular app. So you might enter your age, whether you have any types of comorbidities, whether you're on a certain type of medication, uh, the type of housing that you're living in. Um, and it will also draw from locally available meteorological information to then give you a weighted heat stress scale score with um, a threshold uh, triggered notifications to deliver evidence-based information to help you to reduce your individual heat stress risk. Now, the issue of course, is that many of the most vulnerable won't have a smartphone. They won't have access to data. So what is a really important component of this is also alongside having the individual individualized heat stress scale app is that we also have a public facing display which uses the same system and it's based on a profile of a moderately vulnerable person. Um, and then it still gives people an opportunity to become familiar with it and interact with it and actually gives us a, a platform to deliver information using it. The other good thing about it as well is that we can also use it as a planning and preparedness tool. So for governments or organizations that are looking to um, uh, in advance of heat waves, is that not only do you get the meteorological information, you can then weight that meteorological information with health data, with housing data, to try to identify high risk hotspots that might not be identified using just raw environmental weather data. So that's some of the work that we're doing in Australia. We're at the prototype stage right now, but um, looking to um, scale that up. And then, sorry, one other last thing I'll mention as well with respect to the previous question um, is that a, a big component of the development of that scale and the messaging associated with the app and the and the, the broader messaging system is that we're making sure that we're co-designing all of that information with the with the communities that will be using it and uh and to hunter's point is that the pathway for doing that is working with community organizations who are embedded within those communities that have those pre-existing -exist trust and we can get, we can we can uh, do a proper co-design process which is really important Great, and Juanita, I believe you had a quick follow-up and then we'll turn it back over to our hosts. Thanks, Jason. I'm really intrigued by this idea of individualized um, warnings. I have heard some worker rights advocates in the US be really concerned about privacy issues that wep you, employers would basically weaponize that information. Have you thought about that at all? And we can also take that offline too. <laughs> Yeah, no, my experience in this case within within the military a while, the impetus could be to pick out individuals who are high risk, but the same platform could also allow the trainer in my context you know, to also identify who has more capacity to do more. Uh, because usually it's that 1% they are risk, but the 99% they are fine. But then they are asking, what is this for me with this wearable? You know? The answer is we want to optimize your own potential. And also as a whole system, I think it's not just protecting those who are vulnerable, but ensuring that those who are not succumbing to heat stress maximize their training time accordingly. So I think that $1 you know, will be maximized accordingly. Yeah, thank you. Great, well, let's thank our panelists for the questions and answers. And I'll bring up uh, Joy, and uh, I believe next up we have a poll. Yeah. So thank you again to all of our panelists. And I think that you have seen the breadth and scope and depth of the expertise that we have as part of the Global Heat Health Information Network, the type of partners that we have around the world and how valuable it can be to share these stories, to share the evidence, what is working between governments, between academics, it's really a valuable conversation that all of us as part of trying to help protect communities from a warming world we know how rapidly 
heat is accelerating around the world. Um, and we feel that by coming together through the network, we just have an opportunity to do this better. So, okay. So we wanted to now turn to you and and ask, because this is our first forum, what are the topics that some of which you've heard today are going to, are interesting that we can focus on in the future? If we're going to be having quarterly and regular uh, conversations about various topics, what are those that are most interesting to you? We have a Mentimeter set up, but... Okay, great. So if those of you in the room can see the code at the top of the screen, and for those of you online, it'll be showing up in the chat. Tell us what the topics are from occupational to personalized sensors to equity issues to early warning systems. We've heard about a huge range of topics that are potentially of interest that we should be taking deeper dives on to really explore what are the solutions being implemented around the world that are good opportunities to, to be scaled for, for more sharing and learning. And some of the issues that we're starting to see here are from cooling solutions to research opportunities, how to promote behavior change, the economic impacts of heat, which we've heard a lot about, uh, are needed to move policy change, justice and equity issues to human rights issues, worker health, uh, heat governance, um, more case studies, cooling strategies. Indoor heat is showing up as a key topic in, in the middle. I think we'll take we'll take twenty more seconds um, to see what comes up, and okay, and then we will also be we'll be sending out a survey um, to also help us shape what are the topics for the upcoming forums this year. So, oh, I should not touch. <laughs> um, but knowledge exchange and urban planning, um, again, worker heat, so, and economics. Um, yeah, so I think these are really good um, topics and opportunities that we're going to think about uh, who can be good examples from around the world to share their experience and come forward for. Um, the future uh, forums on, on some of these topics. So this will be an ongoing conversation that we'll have online and through surveys um, that you all can also continue to share with us about. So I think um, we'll call this close. So thank you very much for all of these inputs. And move on. It's not moving to the next slide though. There we go. Great. Um, so, so just to wrap up here, um, we really are very pleased that all of you came here in person or online today, and we'd like to share other opportunities to get involved with the network. And it's first and foremost, join the network, just get involved and come and join future events share with us your projects, upcoming events, findings from your research. We have all of these opportunities on our website, also through social media. Every month we put out a monthly digest of upcoming events and opportunities, a summary of emerging research and specific uh, blogs and uh, opinion pieces on different emerging issues, highlights from projects around the world. And so if you all are sharing 
what you all are finding, we can further help you amplify and share that onward around, around the world. At the moment, we also have an opportunity uh, for another week, there is a job opportunity in Geneva to work with me to manage the activities of the Heat Health Information Network. And again, you can check out our website and find the links for how to apply for that position. And we invite you to join us for upcoming events, not only the online open forums, uh, next month in April, for those of you in the United States, there will be the National Heat Health Information System National Meeting, and we'll be having international sessions. So also bringing participants from around the world to listen to what is happening in the United States. Again, one of our biggest models is learning and sharing. So observing, how is this being done in the United States? You have an interagency coordination mechanism and multi-agency partnership um, that is a really excellent model for, for others around the world. So it's really appreciated that you open your virtual doors to participants around the world to, to listen into to that. Um, so Julie, I think you have some maybe additional closing words. Yes, a very important one. That's a thank you. A thank you to Joy for leading the GIN network so ably for so many years. Hats off to you, absolutely. To all of you for joining. Um, and Joy's right, we are having the NIHIS National, so a shameless plug, but we are actually really, we've dedicated a few hours for international sessions, so we're excited about that. I also wanna thank LAD and the University of Arizona for hosting us here at the center in DC. Um, and for the amazing panelists, uh, really great presentations. I, there were some chat, personal chat and online seemed to, uh, people were captivated by the content. So we did quite a lot of, covered a lot of ground and hopefully stimulated a lot of interest and gave you some insight about next steps that you can do in your job, whatever that is, wherever you actually are. So um, I think with that, we shall say thank you very much. And, uh, Thank you for helping me be a part of our first global forum. Yeah. <laughs>